All right, welcome everyone. We'd like to get started. So we uh, give these two fine people as much time as they need to present this material. So uh, I have the pleasure of introducing them. I actually am the account manager for the University of Utah and have not yet, oh. and to this point, met uh, Dr. Beverly Braille. She's the um, associate director at the Faculty Development Center. And Nate Sanderson is an instructional designer uh, there as well. So. I'm looking forward to this material, and um, yeah, I think uh, we'll let them get started. Thank you, Ike. Hi, I'm Beverly Braille, and I told Ike it would be okay if I elaborated on our introductions because we have lots of titles. Um, I'm lucky to have a joint appointment. I am both faculty and academic staff at the University of Utah. I'm an assistant professor lecturer in the Family Consumer Studies Department and I am the Associate Director of our Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence. And Nate Sanders is an instructional designer who has been with distance education and is now moving over to the Technology Assisted Curriculum Center. And we are joining forces and getting ever stronger. Um, so I want to make sure that I thank some people right at the beginning because I know we're going to run out of time and forget. So I want to thank the rest of the team who worked on the quality course framework and tutorial, some of them who are here with us today, Chin Lee, Eric Yorton, who couldn't be here with us today, Donna Ziegenfuss, and Corey Stokes. We all collaborated together on this project. So thanks to them. Can we open up the course? Thanks. So I wanted to just take a quick minute and pull the audience a little bit to find out who's here. So we hopefully touch on things that we think you'd be most interested in, in terms of the tutorial. So how many of you teach courses? Okay, so we have a lot of people who teach courses. How many of you are instructional designers or in faculty development? Okay, and a lot of the same people. You're like me. Um, and how many of you are in administration? Great. And do we have any students? Oh, we have a couple students. Okay, wonderful, okay, thanks. So hopefully that will help us a little bit. So I wanted to start by giving a, a quick background or history of the tutorial and how we got to this place. So several units on campus were tasked with the um, job of providing support to instructors who are developing courses of all types, but particularly fully online courses. We had on the Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence, the Technology Assisted Curriculum Center, Distance Education, and also the Educational Services Division of our library. And we've been working at first to create a rubric to help instructors assess their online courses. But for several reasons, and I won't go into the full story, we realized that wasn't really the direction we should go. There are a couple of great rubrics out there already, and we realized that our focus is more on helping people develop their courses and supporting them in the development and the teaching. And certainly we also are interested in the assessment component, but we needed to start there with the development. So we wanted to create a dialogue between all of these support teams and the instructors who are developing and teaching the courses. So what we came up with and you know, I said in 30 seconds what took two years to do. <laughs> um, yeah, let's show the graphic. Was the quality course framework. And this is a process that we help instructors work through that's based heavily on D. Fink's approach to course design. And we've used his uh, graphics through the tutorial with his permission. Over the, so this originally was a white paper that described the process, the pedagogical resource, research, excuse me, that underlays the process, and um, the reasons for why we created this process for our institution. We really wanted to tailor to the needs of the instructors with whom we work. After creating this white paper, we realized, well, we need to make this process accessible to people. Some people were already getting involved by coming to the different support units and having consultation with us, but most people who design courses on our campus are people who have very limited time, who uh, don't have a lot of pedagogical training, you know, faculty. So they needed to <laughs> find a way 
to make this accessible to them. So what we did was we created a tutorial in Canvas that is self-led and allows them to access that. So Nate's going to talk a little bit. Oh, he's going to show you the tutorial and talk a little bit about why we chose Canvas for it. He's the tech guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just kind of on the why we chose to do the tutorial in Canvas, like Beverly was uh, discussing, we needed a, not only a dialogue in between the departments to help faculty build their courses, but also the dialogue between faculty and the departments, you know, to get that rolling to help them understand how to build their course, because at, we're at a very large institution, and so there's, there's so many diverse, uh, I don't know, you'd say for the faculty, some know technology, some don't. There's just a huge range. And so we need to get that dialogue started of, do you just need to change one component of your course, or do you want to do a, a complete revision? Uh, we wanted something that was scalable that could help just a, a broad range. And in the process, when we were trying to create our rubrics and kind of going through this thing of what are we going to choose, it was about the same time that the state of Utah was, as a cons consortium, was, was choosing uh, to go with Canvas. And so we thought this was a perfect opportunity. We, we understood that Canvas had the, you could open up your course for anybody to access and look at it, and we thought that would be really easy to have that for faculty to access, administration, or other colleagues. And so, but at the same time, it'd do some other things. It's brand new, so that way we could create a course they could go through and they could learn how to use Canvas while they're trying to learn how to do online quality components. So it was kind of a, a double-edged sword there. Um, when we initially started creating this tutorial in Canvas, we kind of used it as a collaboration tool. And we quickly found out we have six people working together and we were putting our content in the pages and we found out if somebody was editing one page and this, another person had the same page open, and if you saved it, then you lose your data and, and, and it's kind of frustrating. So we quickly moved on to using the collaborations tool and using Google Docs and put everything in there and it, it really streamlined the process because we could sit down in as a group and do everything real time. We could see the edits, discuss the edits, and everybody could have their input, especially if you, we had a if people couldn't make it to the meeting and we were in different locations. That made it so we could work together really well. Um, we used our front page before we made the course public to kind of track the assignments of each uh, team member and what needed to be completed. So every time we went into the course, we knew what was going on. And we could also bring other, uh, colleagues at our university in to review the course before we made it public. We could enroll them in there. Um, so I'd like to go in with, uh, share a couple highlights from the, the tutorial here. We created a, an introduction video for, so the faculty could just get a quick overview. Let's throw it on here. Uh, that one, that one's just a joke. <laughs> but now it's all stuck in your guys' head again, so. <laughs> they'll, they'll do that monkey thing, so every time the music plays, they'll beat the monkey down, you know. <laughs> you will be the monkey. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I'm the monkey. I kind of shot myself in the foot, because I made that last night thinking it was so funny. And then the, the original video, I just hadn't had time to find some copyright-free music. And so there's no music to it, so it's just talking and, and images, and I was like, man, this is kind of lame now without the music. <laughs> Just keep that music going in your head. <laughs> Hello, I'm Corey from the team supporting teaching and learning technology at the University of Utah. Today I'm introducing the quality course framework that you can use when revising and developing your courses. <laughs> The framework adapts foundational instructional design approaches with particular focus on creating significant learning environments using what L.D. Fink calls a backward design process. Aligning learning objectives, assessments, and learning activities. 
This tutorial introduces the framework and provides step-by-step -step exercises to help you use it to design or improve your course. You will learn about the essential elements of a quality course and the major phases involved in the life cycle of a course. Our goal is to help you create a community of learners where students take responsibility for much of their learning. Combining technology tools with sound pedagogical practices can create significant learning experiences for students. We designed the framework so that you can start the process at any phase. With step-by-step -step guidance, you'll be able to accomplish the following. Identify the phase you need to enter for beginning the design or improvement of your course. You do so with the help of the pre-phase checklist we created. After you start the process, appropriately apply the best practices for the elements within each phase. And finally, develop a long-term instructional revision plan. I hope you find this tutorial helpful. If at any time you find you need assistance, please contact us to set up a one-on-one -on -one personal consultation. Thanks. Maybe if we get Corey a uh, Sharpie, he can sign some of your instructor jackets. <laughs> so. One of the points of the video was we tried to make it a little more dynamic to kind of throw out some ideas to faculty of not just uh, doing the PowerPoint like Rebecca had to kill the PowerPoint, um, but do something a little different. Um, and then on the home page here, just kind of a technical, a technical side to this, um, I uploaded, I embedded a YouTube video just because uploading it to Kaltura, there wasn't an easy way to, to aesthetically, you know, center everything and so embedding it, and I did, I did like in the more options here, I guess we're gonna have the analytics now, so it doesn't matter, but I could see how many views it had and, and, and all that stuff, so. Um, now, uh, Beverly's gonna kinda go into a little bit more. Yeah, so I'm gonna just start to lead you through a little bit about what Corey was talking about in the video. So before we get to the uh, prerequisite checklist, to show you where we intend for people to start. So we intend for them to hit begin course content and to go to the, which brings you to the course modules. And we've outlined the course modules in the same way, we're trying to practice what we preach. So in the same way that we've asked them to do learning activities within their own courses. So there should be objectives and isn't it awful I have to look at my notes to remember what I tell them to do? Um, <laughs> objectives, and then your content, some kind of presentation, preferably something that's um, pretty uh, engaging. Some kind of practice or self-assessment, and then an assignment. Here we don't have assignments per se, it's more the task that you complete as you build your course. So you can see up here, can you see that pointer? Yes, you can. Objectives. And then the first set of content are the six elements that we have um, identified as essential. And I'm just going to bring you to one of them. And this course is public, so you can be following along with me if you want now. And you can be using it at your institution. We'll talk a little bit more about that after. So I just want to bring you into one of the elements and show you kind of what it looks like. So they tend to start off with a little bit of background because you know, working with faculty at a Research One institution, they want to know that we didn't just make this up, okay? That there is actually some research to suggest that this, there's a reason this is an element of a quality course. So then we have some objectives for the instructors, and this objective happens to deal with creating objectives. And then here you can see the um, figure that outlines the learning activity. We also include references from the literature so that instructors can go find out more for themselves. And then you can see we've used the module format to help them easily work their way through. <coughs> but as Corey mentioned in the video, we want instructors to be able to go very quickly um, into the specific phase of the process that's relevant to them because we have instructors who are all different points. 
Um, maybe they're teaching online for the first time, or maybe they're teaching for the first time altogether, or they have a course where they have feedback from students and feedback from hopefully their peers and other people as well, but they don't really know what to do with it. Um, people are coming in to course design with all different levels of pedagogical experience and training as well as technical experience and training. So we wanted them to be able to jump in at any point. So we have this pre-phase checklist, which you know doesn't actually have check boxes for them to check, but it is a set of kind of questions and answers. And um, depending on what their answers are, it helps them identify which phase is best for them. And I do just want to point out, we're not here to talk about the framework itself today, although we'd be happy to answer questions at any time um, about it. But the phases are cyclical. So as people go through design, build, teach, revise, the idea is they should then, after they've um, kind of identified what they want to revise, they go back to the design phase. And where did I want to bring people next? Okay, I think that we're going to have Nate bring you into one of the phases. So you can see here we've built it so they can jump right in. And we're going to bring you to phase one. Okay, so in the design phase here, uh, let's quickly look at the layout. Again, we're trying to kind of model maybe some core structuring as uh, instructors go through this. Um, we remind them at the beginning here the, the pre pre-phase checklist, uh, what they need to do to begin this phase. We list their objectives. We list the element that we're referencing with each phase so they can go back if they've, you know, maybe they skipped over it or maybe not, or, you know, they can link to the element, uh, review that, kind of a rationale of why we have this phase. And then we go into the steps. So each phase has steps or, or tasks that they should complete. So we have, you know, writing course objectives, and then we, we're trying, this, this is brand new, it, it, we just rolled it out. So we're trying to fill it with examples from faculty. So um, we have what's called the dreaming exercise, and so they can download that, go through it. If, the, if they're confused about it, there's examples that they can look at and access those. Um, there's an alignment grid where they can align their objectives to their assignments, and we have examples for that. So we're trying really to, to have this, the wording of this and, the, and how it flows to come from the faculty, not necessarily being from us being pushed onto them. And then for, for each piece of the phase, at the end there's uh, an assessment that they can be helped with. You know, who, who can they contact? So in the design phase, um, Beverly's group can help with objectives. Uh, and we're, we try to state that so they know where to go. because. Uh, there's different groups and different people who can help. Let's look at the phase two, which would be the build phase. And one thing uh, we already started incorporating in here are examples from professors. And so what we did this summer, or this early, late spring, is we had a faculty forum. And what we did is we looked through courses on campus and found courses that already had these elements that we're talking about. So in the build phase, one of the elements is using media. And so we found some instructors who were using some clever ways of, of using media. And we, we kind of ran the gambit on a couple of these and had them showcase them for all, for all the faculty. And then we went afterwards, we recorded it, went after and chopped it up and we're putting it in the course so faculty can look at that you know, see the examples, and hopefully we can just build upon that and kind of replace some of the wording we put in here with stuff that the faculty have created. You know, it's kind of like in a course, you want your students to learn from each other in the same way with the faculty. Let me show you a quick clip um, of what one faculty member did. Have any, has anyone seen the, the RSA animates? Have you seen those? They're pretty clever. So we have a, a professor that, her husband's an artist, so she thought this is gonna be easy. You know, he'll draw, I'll do it. And she found out that it took it something like 50 hours to do. <laughs> but um, but I, it, it was clever, it was something new and creative and 
I know the I students probably appreciate that. I just thought, how hard could it be? And uh, <laughs> about 50 hours later, I learned it can take some time. Uh, but it was really fun. So what we have here is just a screenshot. So I, I teach for both environmental studies and political science. I mean, uh, political science too, only one course. And parks, rec, and tourism. So I'm spread all over the place. Um, but this is the first online course uh, that I had fully developed. And let me just show you how this, how this thing works. Um, and everything to do with equal access to healthy food. You're jumping in. We'll in the consider middle. the importance of how green spaces are distributed and maintained in terms of human health. And we'll think about how public spaces are used and by whom. The second essential piece is equity and procedural justice. That's access to the legal and political system, or procedural equity. Do all communities really have the money and know-how to get involved in the legal and political system? We'll see that the history of environmental justice is based on grassroots action. Okay, so that's just an example. And uh, it was really neat kind of going through and looking for some of the stuff, because faculty are already doing it, and we were, it was just a matter of finding it and, and showcasing it out there. Um, and we had several more faculty do some more things on that. And uh, let me show you another one in phase three, in, which is called the teach phase. So this is while they're currently teaching some things that they can look at. Um, and here we talk about uh, communication, teacher to student communication, student to student communication. And uh, we had some uh, really good examples. Uh, this Professor, I'm going to show you here. She teaches a journalism class, and um, she wanted to create kind of a not, not so much a blog, but a, or a discussion, but a place where they could go, post current events, talk about them, share them, learn about them, read them. And so she used the Facebook integration. She created a, a, a Facebook page and then had her students use that. So let's just watch her describe that real quick. A Facebook group. I've only had two students in the four semesters who didn't have Facebook accounts already. Um, so it's pretty accessible and they didn't put up a big fit about having to add it. I, you know, I was like, do it for a semester. You can quit as, sh as soon as we're done. I bet you don't. Um, so what I do, this is meant to emulate in class. I make my students do weekly current events quiz, quizzes. They hate it. They kind of hate me for it. But my bias and my, my reasoning for it is that I don't believe they can write news unless they read it. And it gives us a foundation in class for things to talk about. I can reference current events and news and use those as examples in class. And if everyone's staying up to date, then they can use that. So when I approached the online course, I was struggling to think about how to bring that element and how to force them, really, to read news. Uh, and came up with the idea of a Facebook group. And Canvas, I think, uh, my personal opinion, it does a better job in discussions than in WebCT. But even then, I didn't have some of the interactivity that I was looking for. Uh, what I really like about using Facebook for this purpose is that when they link to a story, you get the little image icon, the direct link. It keeps the conversation underneath that link and related. Uh, and that they can use each other's names in the comments, then get alerts. They get alerts whenever someone posts on it. And some of those things do transfer over into Canvas. But for me, Facebook just felt like a really natural fit for this. And I think that my students have done really well with it um, and had a really natural transition to using it. So this is an example of what a screenshot would look like. Doesn't have the Technicolor. We had to block out names for my students. but. Uh, so these would each be their image of their face and their name. And what each one does is at by... Okay, so that's just a, a quick example of that. Um, again, these are, we're just putting ideas in here for other instructors and faculty, and we, we hope to just to load this thing up with them so it's a, it's a faculty dialogue on, on quality course components. And then I'll quickly just touch on the revise phase. Um, in here, basically, uh, this is very heavily in Beverly's group as far as what is available for getting student data and, and, and feedback on your courses and evaluations for your course and how to implement that and go back into the design phase. And at the very end, we also encourage them to 
uh, create a long-term revision plan because it's not just a one-time deal, especially if they're just revising one lesson, you know, and the next time they go into maybe a little two or three, and just to kind of build on that so it's not just a shock of let's revamp your course and throw all this technology in there and, and make it as cool as we can. So what I really love about this tutorial, so at my institution, I'm one of the few people who are in the unique position, although many of you in this room are in that position, of being an instructor and having the opportunity to work with many other instructors and seeing the really amazing things that they're doing in their courses. And so this tutorial is one place where people can sh provide examples of what they're doing, what's really cool, but it's not just a repository of information and examples, it's built, the examples are built into the framework. This, if you need to build a learning objective, these are examples of learning objectives for different classes on our campus. If you need to think of a really neat way to present a concept, here's some cool things people are doing. So it's connected to what we think will create a quality course. Um, so we just went live at the beginning of April, so actually quite close to the end of our semester. Um, and just yesterday, my center's um, resources pages went live in Canvas as well, which will now um, work seamlessly with this course. Both of them are public courses. So um, we're really excited that everyone on our campus can be using them, but also people at other campuses can be using, adapting, adopting, and we're extra excited about Canvas communities because potentially it means we can all be working together and collaborating to make this the best it can be and um, providing information and resources to one another. Um, there are a couple things that we still want to do, including more uh, examples, as Nate said, putting it in the faculty's voice, removing kind of our dry, uh, boring text. It's, it's excellent. But removing our text and replacing it with the faculty's own voice. Um, and as I said, having this seamless interface between this and the other sets of resources we have available on campus. Don't know how to write a learning objective? Here's a full workshop on writing learning objectives. Uh, and we're now in the assessment phase of figuring out who's using this, how are they using it, is it helping them, uh, is it helping students, which we really hope it will. And so we're really open to any questions or feedback that you might have. And if there's anything else you want us to show you here. Yes? On the objectives, are you strongly encouraging them or having them use the learning objectives feature within Canvas? Or is that even what your objectives are within So the question was, for the learning objectives, are we asking them to use the it's outcomes feature that you're referring to in Canvas? And we encourage people, we let them know it's there. So not everyone on our campus uses Canvas. Some people are totally traditional face-to-face -face with no, if you can imagine, no uh, online component to their course. And so what we hope is that this quality course framework and the tutorial can help all of those instructors. So we're letting them know about all of the tools that are available to them, but we're not saying this is the one right way to do it. Are we tracking usage was the question. So with analytics now, we will. <laughs> yeah, so we've just gone live and so we have, um, we're very lucky to have some money available for instructors who are developing online and hybrid courses. It allows them release time or whatever resources they need, they apply and um, it goes through a, a process. But all of the people who've been granted that, those funds for this year will be going through this. So we know that they will all be using it and we'll be following up with them. And then we'll be following usage after that as well. Yes? Are you offering to the public your services for free? Good question. We're offering people to go in and use the tutorial. And we're hoping to be able to have like forums through the communities where people can work as peers together. No, we unfortunately don't have the resources unless they want to pay us um, for our services, for our, our technology and, and pedagogy services, yeah. How do we access, access this? So we will make it available on the um, InstructureCon 
class. And you could go in there right now and type in this URL and you'd be able to get into it. Yeah, utah.instructure.com courses 33024. Yes, we will. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We will, sorry, the question was, will we put a link to the module, the Instructure Con module, and we will. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, there's another public course full of resources. So we have a wonderful person named Ray Farrelly, who's the new monkey in our office. Um, and so, which I am excited to tell her on Monday because she's not here and she won't know what I'm talking about. Uh, she really was the spearhead behind that movement. And the other public course, it's full of resources and it will link from here. You'll be able to get it um, from here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. We're happy to answer questions offline.